for us to rejoice and to be glad in it. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to meet as brethren. Lord, we thank you that every time we meet your word says where two or three are gathered in your name, you shall be in our midst. Lord, we invite you to be here with us. We even want to pray that you make our hearts good soil, that we shall be receptive to your word. Lord, I pray that everyone who is supposed to be on this call tonight will come and that, Lord, we will be blessed as we share your word. Father, I thank you for our prayed, trusting, and believing in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm struggling with the light, so I may have to deny you my face. At least you know what I look like, um, so that I can be able to see what I'm sharing. So the, the, what we've been covering um, the last two weeks, okay, yeah, I think um, if I just give a recap for those who have not been with us is, we initially spoke about one of the things I've been emphasizing. I said by remind, make us aware that we've started a new season. And um, I don't know about you, but um, for me and many others, it's very obvious that we are in a unique time for Africa, where a unique time for Uganda, particularly as Uganda celebrated her 60th anniversary. Um, I believe there's something that happened. Um, in, in for Uganda, um, that scripture in Isaiah 60 that says, Arise and shine for your light has come the glory. That's just read Isaiah 60. Uh, God, for the past two years, has been speaking to us through Inspire about, Behold, I'm doing a new thing. And that new thing has taken effect. And I speak as a, 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 a guinea pig the experience that I have been through since that time has confirmed that we're actually in that new season. And I believe many of us are going to testify like I already are of what God is doing. And just just pay attention. You know, the thing about God's things, according to your faith, um, it, it, it's, it's, that's how it is. It's faith. Uh, whoever believes, um, receives. Whoever believes, experiences what, what God is doing. And, and so then I went on to emphasize the importance of God's word. And that is the rider. God's word is essential because that's the only way God speaks to us. I can assure you, any way you think he's speaking to you, if it's not confirmed by his written word, then mm, good luck. God speaks through his word. And the Bible says he has exalted his word above his name. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will last forever. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God, and faith only comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we cannot live without God's word. Man does not live on bread alone, but man lives on every word that proceeds from God's mouth. And the challenge I've been making to us is we must be living off God's word. And the challenge I've been presenting is you must read enough of God's word every day. Because, and I gave the example of this number of chapters in the Bible, the Bible, Genesis, Revelations, Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, has got 1,189 chapters. Divide them by 365 days of the year. It's like God has given us a chapter for breakfast, for lunch, for supper, and half for morning tea and evening tea. If you read a minimum of three and a half chapters every day, which is four, chapters alternately, four, three alternately, you'll be able to cover the Bible at least once every year. And the Bible says all scripture is God breathed and is profitable for instruction, for reproach, for correction, for instruction that a believer will be made complete. All scripture, not some, not the ones you enjoy, all scripture is a balanced diet. We need it all, friends. And the challenge is for us to do that. Consume God's word. The, the Jews read the Torah in sequence. They read it and finish, read it and finish. That's why on the day when Jesus entered the temple in Luke chapter 4, he picked the scroll. The reading of that day was actually Isaiah 50, I can't remember what Isaiah it is, where it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the good news. He recited, he was speaking the word for the day. So even us, we must read a portion of scripture every day. And I encourage us to read it sequentially. So that you're writing it in your mind as a story that can easily play back. And it will help you understand and appreciate the application of God's word in life. Because you'll relate it 
children learn by stories. And I'm sure even you, most sermons you enjoy are stories. Jesus preached by stories. So if you register God's word as a sequential, like a movie, think about series, the soaps that we follow, they are sequential. It's easier to remember things that follow. This, I, 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 you can haphazardly read, but I can assure you the more effective way is reading it sequentially. And then um, two weeks ago, I introduced the subject of sin as the greatest challenge for all Christians. Sin, all human, human beings, we are all challenged with the limitation of sin. And all of us, I told us all of us sin, friends. If you're here on this call and you don't sin, then you're a liar. The Bible even tells you that. So we all sin and we sin proportionately to our age because every day of our lives we sin. So the older we are, the more sin we commit. Um, that doesn't mean your sin doesn't get forgiven. Um, that's why we get born again. But sinning, we sin. Uh, believers and unbelievers sin. That one, we, it's just a limitation of our humanity. And last week, we talked about God's solution to this sin. This only solution to our sinful nature is God's power, the Holy Spirit. So when we have the Holy Spirit, it comes and begins to subdue our human nature. And that's why we need to have the Holy Spirit to fill us. As we operate from the spiritual side of him, we will reduce our permission. We will be able to subdue our human side. And, and, and that's why, as encouraging us, that, like the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, when the earth was dark and without form, and the Bible says the Spirit of God was hovering upon the deep, and God spoke. When the Word met the Spirit, it created. So as we fill ourselves with the Spirit of God, and we read God's Word, that Word will come to life in the areas of our life that we're struggling. And that's when we'll be able to speak like Paul. When I was a child, I spoke like a child and I did childish things. Now that I'm a man, I've set them aside. So we need the spirit of God to fill us up. So the two ingredients for our success in this side of eternity is the spirit of God and the word of God. We need to, we, when you get born again, when you get filled with the spirit, the Bible says, Lord, I'll be with you to the end of the age. Jesus' last words on earth in Matthew 28 Verses 18 to 20 says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It says, Lo, I will be with you to the end of the age. So the Holy Spirit is with us. The Holy Spirit is the one that actually gives us. Jesus said, I'm going to send you a helper. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us the ability to understand God's word. It's the Holy Spirit that teaches us God's word. So as you read God's word, he speaks to you in your own context. He customizes his word. The Bible says God's word is living and powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It discerns the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So God's word has its own power. And this is the point I've been telling you. Just allow God's word to enter your ears. Because the only receptacle for God's word is the ears. The Bible says, without, if it says, faith comes only by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. Faith is the substance of hope, the evidence of what we've not seen. Faith is the actualization of, 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 of is the action you take because you believe what God has said. I, I gave the illustration of if I told you that, if somebody told you they are coming, at the airport, they're flying in, and you head to the airport. That is faith, because you believe that they are going to arrive. So faith is like that. You know a promise, and you act on the promise. That is faith, the substance of hope, the evidence of what you've not yet seen. You head to the airport when you haven't seen the person arrive, but you believe they are coming. So when God tells you, by his stripes you are healed, that Faith is believing that what Jesus did has given you healing. And you start acting in the belief that your healing is actual. And that's when the healing will take effect. So faith is a substance of hope. Now, the, the thing that has been on my heart recently, and which is why we've discussed these two areas, is I felt the urge for us to go back to the basics. You know, when you have a season of revival, what it basically means 
is God is giving us a time to be restored, to get back to our original setting. What was Christianity about originally? It's to take a, restoration is to get back to the original settings. To restore is not to give you back what you had. It's to take you back, to restore, to reset, get you back to your original purpose. When me and you became Christians, of what purpose were we getting becoming Christians? That's why I'm speaking about the basic things. Sin, as basic as it is, all Christians suffer from that limitation. So when we have an understanding that we have sin there, but we have a solution God has provided, God's solution for sin is his bathing soap. That is in um, in First John chapter, um, it's in John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just. And will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That is the Christian's bath soap. We use God's word to wash our sins. Whenever you get conscious of those things that you've done that you have not pleased him with, bathe yourself like we bathe every day you get that you bathe again that is how this journey is we confess our sins to god but we confess our faults one to another so sin is confessed to god faults are confessed to one another because as we go about life if i come late if i promise you to do something i don't do it that's a fault that is what we make peace over but sin is to god God is the only one that can forgive sins. So uh, today I want to talk about God's assurance. You know, one of the interesting things is many of us Christians, I, I don't know if I've told you this story. In some school, when I was in Kenya, I used to do a lot of school ministry. And it was interesting when we'd be presenting reports. There's this particular school that the population of the school was about 500 students. But guess what? These guys had a situation where at the end of the term, they had 650 salvations. And guess what? The whole school wasn't yet saved, which meant that many of the students got saved many times because many of them thought they were losing their salvation. And I've, this is the burden I have with the church today. The church today disqualifies Christians because of their sins. And yet all of us sin. That means if everyone had to be disqualified because of sinning, none of us would still be a Christian. The fact that Christ died when we were yet sinners, Christ died 2,000 years ago. This was even before our great, great grandparents had conceived us. He was dying in advance for the sins we are going to commit tomorrow. So when you believe in Christ, friends, the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ. That is the truth. So it doesn't matter what your friends are telling you. Your salvation is very hard to lose. And I think the devil has played on our minds. He's made it look like we lose our salvation very easily. And so many people become unbelievers because they think the mistake they made has disqualified them. The Bible gives us a story of the prodigal son. This guy, was he took his inheritance. And the Bible says he went to a far country and wasted his life in prodigal living until he finished all the resources he had given, he was given. And the Bible says he came to his sense, the guy found himself feeding pigs. And pigs in the Bible are like the dirtiest animals. Pigs is like the bottom of bottomness. By the time your job is to feed the dirtiest, the least valuable animal. And the Bible says he desired the food of the pigs. He was competing with the animals he was feeding to eat. And the Bible says he came to his senses. He says, my father's servants have what to eat and even to spare. I'm better off going to my father and being his servant than me competing with the animals yeah, I'm feeding. That and, and he then preached yeah, this kind of news. And then he no, comes yeah. and then he comes he comes back to the father. And the Bible says he planned in his mind that I'll go and tell my father, make me like one of your servants. The Bible says when the father saw him afar, the father ran to him and he told them to dress him up and put on him a ring. He was restored to his position. Friends, that is what happens when you believe in Christ. When you accept Christ, everything comes 
you get back to a clean slate. And that is the truth. So don't believe the lies of the devil that we've lost our salvation because you made one, two, three mistakes. I'm, I call them mistakes intentionally because the things that our sinful nature is a limitation of our humanity, but our relationship is greater than our, 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 our fellowship is, actually, let me put it this way. When we sin, it affects our fellowship. In the Bible, the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve, after they ate the fruit, the Bible says, they got away of their nakedness. It's interesting, the chapter before it says they were naked, but were not ashamed. But when they ate the fruit, their nakedness became uncomfortable. And therefore they hid. And when God came, they could not, they're not comfortable. Their fellowship with him was interrupted. So sin affects our fellowship. But we need to ensure that our fellowship does not eventually ruin our relationship. So there are two degrees. There is fellowship is the free spirit that you have with God. What sin does is it distorts that freedom. But the relationship, the Bible says, he came to his own, but his own knew him not. But as many as believed in him, he gave them the right to become the sons of God. You become a child of God. That is a relationship. And he says nothing. Ask, what can separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble, hardship, pleasures or friends? What can separate us? Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. So the relationship that we have with God, with Christ, when you believe in him, is so powerful. It is the fellowship that gets interrupted when we sin. And that's why when you confess your sin to him, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to restore your unrighteousness. So sin affects our fellowship. But if our fellowship is persistent, it can interrupt our relationship. I don't know whether I'm making a point. So the point about sin is it affects, and that's why when, even us, I'm sure we all know this from ourselves. When you have done something sinful, you are not comfortable to go to God's presence. That's why we need those to come into, you need to repent, you need to make peace, ask God to forgive you. And that's exactly illustrated by the prodigal son. The prodigal son came to his senses. He came to the realization that he was not in the right state. His sonship did not go away because he had gone to afar. The father still regarded him as a son. And that's why when he came back, the father just, and it's funny, at the end of that story, it's the elder brother who comes back and finds us what's happening. And he says, they're celebrating your son, your brother, because he was lost, now he's found. And he said, but my father, you've not even slaughtered a goat for me. And the father said, my, my son, all the things I have here, you remember, the father had two sons. He gave the younger son his thing. So everything else was disguised. So that is how Christians are. The people who have never lost fellowship. You know that the, the people who criticize the people that have sinned are the ones who, the Bible says, let him with sons take it as he falls. It's the Christians who think they, have not, they don't have a weakness in a particular area that are very hostile to the ones that have. To them, I'm part of a WhatsApp group, um, one of the church groups. And I think there's a story that has appeared in the Ugandan daily um, regarding a person who is a believer. And I'm, I'm seeing the criticism that is being shared on the group. And, and that is it. That's typical of us Christians because we quickly criticize, we quickly take down our, our, believe, our fellow believers when they fall. We are the, in fact, somebody has put it this way, that Christians are the only army that, that hurts the, their wounded. They despise, they don't take care of their wounded. So one of the things I'm trying to challenge us with as I make this point is that we need to have compassion for people that are struggling with sin because it affects their fellowship with God. Already just by itself, the very nature of the sin affects the fellowship. So what we need to do is help them restore that fellowship. And, and that is 
what we are there for, to encourage each other. It says, the Bible says, let's, let's not give up the habit of meeting together as some are doing, but let us encourage each other in the faith as that day approaches, the day of his coming. So we have an obligation, friends. The Bible says that we should, we are each, other, each other's keeper, our brother's keeper. And the expectation is that we should help our friends who are struggling. And I, I can't remember what scripture it says, but when even Peter was being taught, when Peter said he was not going to deny, when Jesus said, Satan has asked for you and I've prayed for you that you will overcome. And when you come, when you overcome, come and encourage your brothers. That's exactly what happened. Peter said, even if all these guys forsake you, me, I won't. And the, Jesus told him, tonight before the cock crows twice, you'd have died me three times. Peter thought he had the ability to overcome temptation. And we know that that didn't happen. And after that, Peter actually ended up being the one who was encouraging the brethren. And so that is the whole point. When you struggle with a certain situation and God gives you victory, the challenge for you is to help other people that fall in the same, same slate. Because that is why we go through these situations, that we may be able to strengthen each other. So I wanted to just push on, and, and the subject I wanted to discuss was God's assurance. Um, uh, the, in my daily reading, the part of the Bible I'm in is Second Kings. I've, I've basically been reading, I told you I read chronologically, so I'm in the book of Kings. But something that struck me is just to see um, where I read it yesterday, I think it was today, is we see Hezekiah. Hezekiah came in. I can't remember who he came after, but Hezekiah was a righteous king. When he came in, he destroyed the, the, some of the, the, the Baal, he destroyed the high places. He did the right things um, for God. And, and until the point when um, he fell sick and um, God sends prophet Isaiah to tell him to put his house in order. And Ezekiel looked that way and told God, you know what? No, just remember the things I've done for you. And God told Isaiah, go back and tell this guy, I've re I'm going to give him more time. And he comes back and Isaiah tells him, yeah, that God is going to give you another 15 years. And, and so he tells him, okay, how do you want God to prove it? And that's when the sundial moved 10 steps backwards. It says going down is how it always does, but take it back is not possible. Just as a, a side show, apparently even you notice the cycle of time is not exactly 365 days. That's why over a period of four years, we then have a, a sixth day, a, another day. So it's 366 days, the leap years. That actually is accounted for, I'm told, by the two incidents in the Bible. One was where, actually three incidents. No, yeah, it was it's two incidents. One, when Joshua told the sun to stand still. Remember when they were fighting the Gibeonites? Joshua told the sun, the sun to stand still. So that was one, what's one, one, one portion, plus the 10 steps, the dial back that Hezekiah created. That actually distorts the full cycle of the sun. So apparently actual science has proved that this, that fraction of time is a result of those two incidents. Uh, that was just a side point. But reading Hezekiah, so after Hezekiah comes Manasseh. Now Manasseh apparently was the wickedest king of Israel, of Judah. The Bible says he was more wicked. He did things that were even worse than the Amorites, the Jebusites, the people that were displaced. Can you imagine this? And, and what puzzles when I was talking to my wife this morning and I was telling her, it's amazing how one righteous king is succeeded by a very wicked one, then succeeded by another righteous one. And so we're wondering, where is the problem? And if you notice, when you read the book of Kings, it mentions the mothers, because I believe in the time that time, the kings definitely had more than one wife. And it appears to me that the mothers are the ones who brought up their children. So if the mother, I noticed where the mother was a priest's daughter, the kids would be righteous. And if the king's mother was a worship of Baal or whatever, the Ashuri, those are people, the child would be wicked. And so this is what happened. So from Hezekiah, a righteous king, we have Manasseh. And the irony of it is Manasseh ruled the longest of all the Jewish kings, the kings of Judah. <laughs> he ruled for 55 years. In my 
understanding. It's like God was really giving the guy a chance to come round. God gave him enough time to come to his senses like the prodigal son. And I think if I, my recollection is right in Chronicles, I think he made peace with God. I can't remember now, but when I get there, I'll, I'll, I'll remember to tell us. So after Manasseh, then comes Josiah. Now Josiah is the one who fulfilled the prophecy that, that Jeroboam was given. If you remember when they, after Solomon, because Solomon married many wives, the Bible says that um, God said he would tear the kingdom of, of, of Israel from him. And, but because of his promise to David, he would remain with one tribe, two tribes. That's kind of, he was remained with Judah, but I think they were able to take Benjamin as well. So the rest of the nations went to the north, to the kingdom of Israel, and we had the kingdom of Judah. And what then happens is Jeroboam was anxious. Jeroboam was given a prophecy by, I can't remember the name of the prophet Ahijah. And this guy told him, if you walk in my statutes, I will give you, you'll have someone in your king. It's the same promise God gave David, was being made to Jeroboam. But when Jeroboam came into power, Jeroboam got insecure. And he says, you know what? If people continue going to worship in Jerusalem, eventually they'll, they'll switch allegiance. So he said, no, let me build altars. So he created two calves, a calf in Samaria and a calf in Dan, in the two extreme ends of his kingdom. And says, guys, this is the God that brought you into the world, into this promised land. And he even decided to appoint his own priest, not even the Levites. So he went against God immediately. That's why in the old in the book of Kings, they keep referring to the sin of Jeroboam. And because of that, God made his kingdom last for only four generations, and he cut him off. So Jeroboam, but the day that he created these altars, God sent a prophet who came and told him, Jeroboam. On this altar, the priest's bones shall be sacred, shall be burnt. And Jeroboam said, and as a sign of this, this altar is going to split. So at that point, Jeroboam points and says, arrest him. And the guy's hand withered. And when his hand withered, he asked the prophet to pray for him that the hand would heal. And God allowed the prophet to pray for the hand healed. You know that story. That was a young prophet who got deceived by an old prophet. Eventually, the guy got in by land. I won't tell that part of the story. So Josiah was prophesied that a, a king called Josiah will come on the scene and he will sacrifice, the, he'll, he'll burn the bones of the priests, of that, the fake priests on that same altar. So after Manasseh, the wickedest Judas, uh, king of Judah, comes Josiah. Now, when Josiah comes on the scene, the first thing Josiah did because Josiah's mom was a priest, was a daughter of a priest. He asks, and I don't know if you remember, I, I, I may be telling stuff you may not have read, but I'll just say the story. There was another son of another of the kings, um, one of the kings whose father died, and the mother, the time when, um, in the, if you remember this, not so when, God, when Elijah anointed Elisha, he also anointed, he said, after Elisha, there would be Jehu, and there would be, I can't remember, the, there were four, three people who were supposed to come, and this, basically it was, Elijah came on the scene to destroy King Ahab, Ahab's wickedness that had come because of Jezebel. Now, sorry, I'm getting jumbled up, but I'm just trying to make a point that one of the sons of the king was born and was young when the father was killed. And his mother, Ahazia, the on, Athalia, she's called Athalia, the only queen, there was a lady queen of Judah called Athalia. She ruled for seven years. This mother killed all the sons of her son, all the eligible successors. She killed them, but his sister, the sister of the father who had died, killed one of his sons called, I think it was called, um, I forget his name. He was here in the temple. So because that guy was kept in a temple, that guy, when he became king, later on after they, 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 they coronated him, when he became king, he instructed the priests to put together a, a box that would collect money to repair the temple. I guess because he stayed in the temple, he saw how dilapidated it was. So he had a passion 
for the temple. So they started collecting money with the plan to re repair the temple. But over years, they did not get to do the repairs. And so that practice kind of sh shriveled up. So when, when King, um, when Josiah comes as a king, the first thing Josiah asked was, can you guys collect that money and use it to do the repairs? When they start repairing the temple, they come across the scroll, the Bible, the, the Torah, the scriptures, and they brought the scriptures to him. And when he reads the scriptures, he immediately sees the promises God had made to Israel and what would happen if they disobeyed. And he immediately realized that we're in this situation because we disobeyed God's word. And he gathered all the people to read God's word. So the point I'm trying to make is that was the beginning of the restoration of Judah. So when you have a revival, God's word has to become center. And that's the emphasis I've been making, that God's word has become the center of your life. And when you put God's word in the center, it's going to cause your life to begin to revolve around him. I know many of us are strong. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, offer yourself as a living sacrifice. Because this is, a please, this is pleasing. And it says, be ye not conformed to the standards of this world, but be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind, by God's word, that you'll know that good, perfect, and pleasing will of God. Once you get God's word in the center of your life, it will cause you to begin to operate from God's mind on issues. Mm -hmm. and, and that in itself will get you back to your true north. So one of the greatest challenges we have as Christians is many of us do you know that question is, do you know what God's will is for your life? And truthfully speaking, many Christians don't know, but it's because they have not sought it. I've quoted to us Psalms 139, where he talks about God knowing us before we were formed in our mother's womb. And he wrote each day concerning us in his book before any one of them began. So God has scripted your life before he put in your mother's womb. That means there's already an assignment you have been created for. So friends, you, you, you already, there's something specific you are created to do. It's, we're not just hustlers. All of us are born for a specific thing. The challenge for me and you is, have we found that thing out? And because God has created for a specific thing, he has put into you the things that you need for that thing. Those are the passions. Those are the gifts. Those are the things that you do very easily. So your passion, your gifts, your desires are part of the equipment that give us an indication of our purpose. And so the challenge for me and you is if we don't bring these things forth, that means we will not have fulfilled the purpose for which we are created. And you can only find this out as you read God's word. It will tickle. The Bible says God's word is living and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. It discerns the thought and intents of the heart. It's able to determine. So you, you'll find your inclination towards that thing that God has created you to fulfill. There's certain things you'll find very easy to do. There are some people who are just natural friend makers. They just, it's so easy for them to make connections. That is part of the purpose that God has created them for. And so the challenge for me and you, especially that are living in the environment that we live in today, where you're born, they take you to this education system that begins to mold you into something that it wants you to become. So because you've enrolled for that course to become a doctor, they give you a way of thinking of doctors. And so what ends up happening is you, you, you have to stop being you. So not what I'm basically saying is not all of us have become what, we, what God created us to become because we've not quite followed our passions. We've instead followed the things that, that's the challenge of our education. I normally make this comment when I'm talking to my wife and saying, if you compare the education we have in Africa and the education in the West, in the West, 
they teach them to think. They, they, are, they are allowed to express themselves. Whereas ours is, this is a what? A cup, a what? A cup. This is a plate, a what? A plate. So we're taught to recall, to, re to regurgitate what we are taught to the point that if you don't repeat the answer the teacher gave you, you fail. Whereas in the West, if you copy somebody else's information and you don't acknowledge them, that is plagiary. Are you getting the difference? And that's what we do now for us. In, in, when you're doing the undergrad, you, and undergrad, you're allowed to repeat what you're told. But when you're doing the dissertation, they tell you, no, you need to, if you quote somebody's material, you need to tell us, give us your, I can't remember what they call it in those dissertations. You need to acknowledge the authors of the information you quoted. And a PhD is when you introduce new knowledge. But these other, the Western hemisphere and the North, they are taught to think from the beginning. So the, I'm just trying to make the difference. They are made to gravitate towards their passions. I'm told in some institutions, they give the children toys and other children play with the toys. You can see the ones who are inclined towards engineering because they are breaking the toys and trying to fix them up. You see the ones who are looking after the baby, the, the dolls. You see the ones who are crafted to be nurses. So all of us have got something unique. And the thing is, God gives this to us as passions. So fortunately for us in church, we get a chance to participate in the things we like to do as extracurricular activities. So you find the people like talking, find themselves able to go out witnessing or go out preaching. So we, we find a way of practicing our gifts in church. But that's why Miles Munozano calls that your work. Every one of us has, but many of us have settled for jobs. A job is what you're paid to do. A work is something. Continue by just challenging us. I, did I drop off? Hello? Yes. Am I still on the Hello. Call? Sorry. Yes, yes you're yes, okay. Debbie, help me send Alexis at Santilla in Fellowship. Okay. Yes, so the, the challenge is for us. It will help us. It's, it's basically, it will make. Towards the things that were designed to become. But ultimately, the one thing that we're all unified in doing is as ambassadors of Christ. It's to be witnesses. The Bible says we're ambassadors of Christ, as if God was pleading through us to get reconciled, to get men reconciled to Him. Our ultimate purpose, all of us universally, is to draw into the kingdom the people that are lost. Because the Bible says God died for all of us. The Bible says God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Christ died for everybody. Friends, there's enough space for all creation in heaven. Every one of us has a slot. The challenge is for us to give people the opportunity to make that decision because we know about it. We know the truth. The Bible says when you know the truth, the truth shall make you free. Because we know the truth, the last words of Jesus Christ in Matthew 28, 19, 18, 19, and 20, his last words. I know some of you have heard me make this statement before. The last words of somebody is what we call their will. That's why when somebody dies, their will is very important. I've told you the story of the lady called Sandra West. She was a widower of a very rich um, Texan billionaire. And this lady had inherited her husband's estate. And so when she was dying, she put in her own will that her brother, who was the only relation, because they didn't have children, could inherit a million dollars, I can't remember, more than a million dollars, if he honored her will. And her will was she wanted to be buried in her favorite Ferrari, Jaguar, a Jaguar, and in her laceless gown. She wanted to be buried in her favorite nightgown 
and in a car. That's, she wanted, that's her desire of how to be buried. And she said, if her brother honors his, her will, he can inherit a million dollars. But if he doesn't, then he will only get like 50. I can assure you if you are her brother, you do everything in your power to honor her will. And that's what this guy did. So this is actually a true story. So when she dies, they opened the will and that was the one guy said, we've never, first of all, no one had ever been buried in a car. It was just unheard of. So they go to court, the court ruled that you cannot alter the will of the dead. They go to the higher court, it ruled in the same way, you cannot alter the will of the dead. They went to the Supreme Court and the ruling was, you cannot alter the will of the dead. So the day for this lady's burial came and they dressed her up in her favorite night gown. They lowered the driver's seat, they put her on it and they lowered this car six feet under the ground. And as you can imagine, they filled the grave with, with, um, with, with concrete to make sure that guys don't steal it. You can, it's a true story, by the way, you can Google it. She's called Sandra West. You can read the story. So if a human being, you cannot alter the will of a human being, how much more can we not alter the will of the Son of God? The last words of Jesus Christ on earth are recorded in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. Jesus standing on the Mount of Olives said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It says, Lord, I'll be with you to the end of the age. Friends, I want to finish by just challenging us that the one thing we all have a, an assignment to do, what God has created us for is just the, the location or the, the, the target group the people he'll cause us to access. We are created to access people. And so your gift is what will give you a particular crowd of people. So by God allowing me to come and work in the foreign country, he's giving me access to people in the region. Before I came to the Middle East, I was very limited on my knowledge of the Islamic faith. I have almost been schooled. I understand their belief system so well that I can have a decent conversation with them and know at which place I can present the gospel. So God has created us ultimately to bring people into his kingdom. That is the ultimate purpose. The season on earth after man fell is God trying to reconcile himself to us. He wants all of us to qualify because after we get out of these bodies, we are going to live with Christ forever. In fact, you've heard of the millennium. When Christ comes, after this period of grace ends, we're going to have Christ come in person to rule on earth for a million, a thousand years. And then we shall be in to eternity. I've always told us eternity is longer than life. Friends, I have overshot. Apologies for that. I hope you've learned something. May God bless you. Amen. 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 Thank you, Uncle Paul, for sharing uh, such an intuitive word. Um, at this moment, I will come in one of us with anything to supplement what Uncle Paul has shared, or if you have any questions to ask, this is the time. Purity, do you have something to say? Yes. Okay. Uh, how is everybody? Good. Can thanks. you hear me? Yes, you're loud and clear. Okay, thank you. Our network is not very good. Um, I, I have a question. Last time I was not able to finish my question because the network went out. But um, uh, I like the topic today of assurance. And um, the question I have is, yes, we have faith. And um, why do we believe that our faith is the only faith that is eligible for eternity and for heaven? 
what makes it so unique apart from the other religions and the other faiths? If, if, if I had to, 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 to compare or convince somebody that my faith is the, the assurance I have is the only way, which would be the best approach I would use. I would like uh, Paul to give some little highlights because this becomes a big challenge. Thanks, thanks, Purity. That's, that, that question is a thesis. Um, but I'll give you some nuggets. And I think what I'll also plan to do is I'll share on that at some point. But um, it's interesting, I've had a debate with a colleague, a friend, who was, a, he claimed to be atheist. And, and, and so I, I told him, this is how we, I presented the debate to him, I told him, can we imagine all the faiths on earth are fake? Mm -hmm. They're all fake. Now, let's listen to which gave the best story. And, and so we said analyzing them, and, and from that debate, ah, agreement was that Christianity was peculiar because of the solution being somebody dying and rising again mm -hmm. because that is the that's the greatest the, the worst thing that can happen to human beings is death death is mm -hmm. the ultimate and so anybody who can come back to life mm -hmm. is more powerful than humanity and and mm -hmm. so the the uniqueness of how god dealt with salvation so let me put it this way um when when you i i know i'm giving you the argument from a, a biased view but I, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm making a case for it um mm -hmm. when you look at this this the bible story i'm, I'm, I'm going to make comparison bible and other books i'll highlight a little of what I know about them, is in, in the, the Bible story, the mystery of God's word, the Bible, is in its formation. The Bible is a collection of 66 books that were written by over 40 authors that lived in three continents over a period of 1,500 years. And yet this book is coherent. Mm -hmm. It's it's a collection of prophecies and fulfillment. In fact, they say the Bible has over 2,500 prophecies, of which 2,000 have been fulfilled precisely. There are still another 500 that are yet to fulfill. So the Bible by itself, which is the authentic word of God, is itself a mystery. So the fact that it's a mystery is, you know, I, so that is, let me start from there. So the, the word of God, as we know it today, even if we just start to the five, in fact, the Torah, the first five books is the Bible completed. Because Moses was told when, I believe this happened when Moses was the mountain. God narrated, people normally ask, where does Adam get his wife? Oh no, rather, where does Cain and Abel get their wives? If I asked you, how you knew Paul, you will say, you met me at this fellowship, some of you. The question is, how did I come to the fellowship? When, so, because it was an account, God was telling Moses the story of creation. His, his, it's a narration. It's like I tell you, hey, I met Debbie when this and this and this happened. But I've not told you when did Debbie even get bored. So, the, it's an account. So, God narrates to Moses the creation. So God is basically trying to tell Moses how man was created perfect, how man fell, and how man was God planned to restore man, and how he started with Noah, men became wicked again. Then he chooses Abraham, he takes him to this land. So that whole story, Abraham gets this dream, the people go to Egypt, to Israel, to to to, to Egypt. After 430 years, God calls Moses to go and restore them. And then he tells them, after this, they're going to promised land. They says, if they obey these words, but they're going to disobey. God even told him they're going to disobey. They're going to ask for a king. They'll disobey and I'll scatter them. And then after that, I'll recover them. Then it says, I will send a brother like myself. Moses prophesies about Jesus. So in the five books of the Bible, the rest is now 
an account of that summary. So Moses has told the whole story. So guess what? After that, they asked for a king. Exactly what God had. In fact, after that, after Moses has died, Joshua comes, they go into the promised land. We know they, they don't conquer all the tribes. So sin continues to come back. Eventually, they start worshiping Baals. They get displaced from Israel. They get scattered. But the Bible says that there will be a remnant. Eventually, we know they come back. As we know how Israel has been reformed, but eventually Christ also comes and Christ dies. So that whole story, everything as was prophesied. But in the time when the children of Israel were misbehaving, God sends prophets different times. So all the, the prophets. So the Bible is a collection of the Pentateuch, which is Moses, is history, and then God's promise and the God's laws. And then we have the, from there we have the judges. We then have it, the history of the kingdom being formed, the kingdom splitting, the kingdom being destroyed. In between, we have prophets, the big major prophets and the minor prophets. Then we have a period of silence. And then we have John the Baptist, who was prophesied about by Malachi. At the end of Malachi, he says, God will send Elijah before the coming of the Son of God. And that's why when they're asking Jesus, he said, Elijah has already come. That was John the Baptist. John the Baptist came before Christ came to reconcile the fathers to the sons. So all that, then we have Jesus coming, dying. The gospel then starts spreading with the disciples. The whole the Holy Spirit comes. As to the whole Bible itself prophesies and fulfills. So 630 years later, this a prophet, this young man is born in, the, in Arabia. And he comes up with a version of story. I, I don't want to discuss this now, but that was a subject of another day. But you cannot discount. So this is 600 years later. Even time is measured before Christ and after death. That is significant enough that Christ actually existed. Now, if Christ who died and rose again is true, then everything about him is equally true. The Chinese, Chinese medicine is believed to be older than Christ. Than, because if they say Chinese medicine is for 5,000 years. In Chinese history, they have an account of a day when there was darkness for three and a half hours on the day of just crucifixion. I don't know, you should look for a movie or it's actually a documentary on the shroud. The shroud is the cloth that was used to wrap Jesus' body. So I'm going really on and on. I'm going back it here. The shroud is a cloth. They did a forensic assessment of the shroud using modern technology. And they created a hologram of X-ray and I can't remember the third thing. Because remember, it was a dark grave and light shone. So it created an image on this cloth. Like it took a photograph. It proves that the body that was wrapped was killed in the description we know Christ to have died. In fact, the guy who was in the project was a Jew, an unbelieving Jew. The guy says this is true. It's, this is a documentary it's on Netflix, I think. Debbie can attest, we watched it during the Easter. So there is scientific proof of the account of the Bible. So for me, that is sufficient. But that aside, I've also had the experience as an individual. My salvation, <laughs> I graduated from the one of believing by faith also. You know, there's also faith that you have, you have faith. Some Christians are believing that they believe. There's, there's that, you know, it's just like a feeling. You, you, you've really not experienced. I can attest to my own experience. So I feel like Paul, when the Bible says, Paul was committed to weeding out the people of the way. But when he had an encounter with Christ, Paul became more passionate than the guys who he was trying to kill. Because something significant happened. Now, Paul, today, in the Arabia, now let me tell you something, just because of living in Arabia, I have got to see the history of Arabia is what we read in the Bible. During the expo last year, we went to the Iran, the Iraq pavilion. Their history is what you read in the Bible. I was so mesmerized. The food you read in the Bible is the food they sell in the supermarkets here. The Bible is real, friends, because for the Arabs, it's history. 
Yesterday, one of my colleagues was telling me about a practice they have before they get married. The girls go out and, you know that story of Jephthah in the Bible, where the, the girl who, Jephthah, promised God that the first thing that comes if he wins the battle is sacrifice. That story yes, for them yes. is a tradition. They, they mm -hmm. call it henna. In the Arabs call it henna. But that is that story we read the Bible. It's, for me, it's so fascinating just living here. I've seen the Bible come to life. Because for them, because they've been taught an alternative view, but the reality is what we read. In fact, I keep saying, if they could just read the Bible, they'd be shocked that it explains what they practice. I'm sorry, I've gone round and round, but um, I've compared the two most significant faiths, just to make my point. The rest, I mean, we can talk about the Buddhists, they're all, and they all come from animism. So animism is the belief that all God is in nature. That's why even the Africans used to worship rivers, lakes, mountains. So mm -hmm. that religion, that they call it animism, traditional religion, is what became Hinduism, that you, you keep getting improved. That's why Hindus believe that everything is God. So in Hinduism, they believe when you die, when, if you don't attain perfection, you come back as a, if you live badly, you come back as an inferior being. So if you're a human being, you come back as an animal. If you are, you die as a bad animal, you come back as a lower animal. You become a cockroach. So you get lower and lower if you live badly, and you get superior, you become a guru if you live right. So Hinduism. Now, Buddhism is another level of that, where they have Buddha. So Hinduism, Buddhism are all related. They're just... And they already to, that's why Hindus have so many gods, because God is in everything. So all these are the exact equivalent of the religions that existed in Bible times. In Bible times, those are different manifestations of Baal, Baal, Asherah, all those gods written in the Bible are the same. In fact, it's like ironic that every, this God and others, anything that is not Jehovah, Jireh, is the same God in different forms. That's why it's easier for all the other faiths to accept each other, but not this faith, because this is the only one true God. The rest are gods that subscribe to the alternative, which is Lucifer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Uncle Paul. That was quite detailed. I'm here today with my best friend. He can say hello. I brought a friend. Hello. 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 Yeah, you can hear me. Yes, yes we, we can. can. Yes. We um, can to say it in Kenyan. We can. Yes. My name is uh, Sami Kuri. And Purity is my wife. So we're here nice together. To meet you. I, I listened to the whole story and uh, it's good. I've learned something. Thank you. Good to have you here. Make this your Friday plot. To use Thank Debbie's you. words. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was the discussion we had yesterday and we have concluded so well today. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you so much once again, Uncle Paul. Anyone else with something to supplement on what Uncle Paul has shared? in regards to faith and assurance. I'll actually say I didn't get to my topic. <laughs> I, I stopped at the introduction, but we'll, we'll pick it up next week. All right. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, I just wanted to add on to what Paul has said, how we passionately talked about uh, the differentiation between Christianity and other religions. That question was asked in the past, in the time of Elijah, whereby Elijah was challenged to prove that God is God, and uh, the prophets of Baal would also prove that their God is alive. Eh? So we, we know the story of what Elijah did and how God answered by fire, and the other God couldn't help uh, the prophets of Baal. Eh? So just to summarize, the the best way we can prove, or the best way we can tell people that our God or our faith is the true faith, is that there is no other God who has ever spoken to people the way God has done. God 
he, he, he confirmed Jesus Christ to be his son. At the time of baptism, he spoke to Moses. He has spoken to so many human beings. But other gods don't speak. Most of these other religions, they don't have any evidence or any, any record that their gods have actually spoken to them. So I think that is just one of the angles we can look at our faith. Just like Paul says, sometimes when you actually experience God or you see him practically, the conviction is much more than just believing, believing, as some Christians say. So our God has proved over and over again that he's the true God speaking to us as human beings, uh, speaking from heaven, people have heard his voice. So I don't know whether there's any other God who has spoken to humanity the way our God has spoken. So that proves beyond reasonable doubt that our faith compared to other faiths is quite unique. Thank you. Thank you, that was a good one. Thank you, thank you. Anyone else? Um, Okay, since there is no one else, um, I think also for me, when we talk about how to, to compare our God with the other gods, our God has been able to make miracles, make wonders that are visible for people. He opened eyes for the blind. He made the, you know, the crippled walk, which has been, we've not seen or witnessed any of that from the other gods that those people worship. So also the miracles, they verify that our God is the God, is the number one God. Yes. Yeah. If I could also add, if, if you remember, the interesting thing about Christ's resurrection was before he died and rose again, Lazarus died. And if you remember, Lazarus was dead four days before he went. So if Jesus could resurrect a guy who was dead four days, because the Jews believe that the spirit gets out of the body on the fourth day, which means after the third day, rather the third day, after the third day, resurrection is impossible because the spirit, they say when if somebody dies, the spirit lingers around the person. And on the third day, he lives. so even their graves have a window as if to let the spirit leave. So Jesus demonstrated the, his power over death in resurrecting Lazarus. So by the time his own death happened, clearly he must have resurrected. Because if he could resurrect a guy, then he himself must have power over death. Yeah, I just thought the, the most significant reason of Christianity is the death, the solution, God's power over death. Because that's the worst humans can, the worst that you can do to a human being is kill them. So Christ being able to reverse that is, is the most, so that's the greatest miracle you can ever create, you can ever perform. And he did it severally. In fact, even Elisha's bones resurrected a body. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you once again, all, for being part of this uh, fellowship tonight. Uh, I hope next time you'll come with a friend. At this moment, I will welcome those with prayer requests to send them in the chat, or you can unmute and send them out so that we can. Uh, pray to close. Yes. You can either type in the chat or unmute and say out your prayer request. Hello. Hello, hello. I have a prayer request. Okay. I have a spiritual daughter who has waited upon the Lord for 44 years. And she's about to get married, but they are having a big problem with the government authorities so that she can get Let's pray that the Lord will make a way to be able to get clearance from the government, but they're still waiting for clearance from the government. 
Oh, we missed some of something. What clear? We missed you. From the government authorities, oh, from the okay. attorney general. Okay. Yeah, in Kenya, you have to get clearance from the attorney general before you marry in church. Oh, okay. Um, Uncle Paul, you'll have uh, pray for that. Uh, anyone else? My prayer request is for closures. I pray to get uh, clients that, um, that I'm able to close deals at work. And I also pray for family breakthrough. Um, Lillian is praying for, for God's grace and favor. Okay, I will I'll start the prayer and then I'll hand over to Uncle Paul to uh, pray for the other prayer requests. Heavenly Father, we bless your holy name this evening. We thank you for you have given us this opportunity to gather here in your name, O oh Lord. We thank you for the word that you've shared with us, O oh Lord. We thank you for reminding us that you alone are God, Abba Father, that you are the King of Kings and that you are the Lord of Lords, Abba Father. We come before you with our prayer requests. Some of us might not have um, listed them. We pray that you will cover us with your uh, precious blood, O oh Lord, that you will intervene, O oh Lord, that you will answer, that you will meet us at our point of need, O oh Lord. Father, we need your grace in our families. We need your grace in our jobs. We need your grace. We need your favor. We need your blessings. We need your intervention in our families. Abba, Father, we pray that you come through for us, O oh Lord. We're trusting in you because you alone are the only one that knows us in and out, Abba Father. We pray that you come through. We actually pray for Lillian even as she uh, seeks God's favor and intervention. Father, we pray that you come through for her, that you teach her your word, that you instill wisdom in her to understand your word, Abba Father. Father, we are uh, humbled to be before you. We are humbled because you've been uh, with us throughout this journey. We thank you because you've been present. You've been all powerful. We can surely worship you and we can surely let you take control of our lives because you know us well Abba Father we thank you we glorify your name and even as we go to sleep Father I pray that you give us a good night's sleep that you bless us and that you bless the weekend that you'll be with us for our prayed and believed in Jesus' name Amen 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 over to you Uncle Paul Father in heaven, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for the opportunity to meet. We thank you for the sharing of your word. We thank you, Lord, for whatever we plan tonight. We want to pray that you establish it in our hearts. We pray that you give us a passion and a, bad, a passion for you and a burden for the Lord. That Lord, you will cause us to, to reach out to those that do not know about you and tell them about you. Lord, we want to pray then for uh, our sister who's intending to get married and is having a delay of her authorization from the attorney general's office. Lord, we want to pray that you will um, you'll, you'll open that door for her, Lord. I pray that you will intervene in the whatever is caused the delay. And Lord, that you'll accelerate it, that Lord, you will grant her the desire of her heart. Lord, we want to pray for the other requests that are in the chat. I can't, I can't read them, but Lord, you know the desires of the people that have request there. Lord, your word says that, um, that if we ask and, and believe, Lord, you're faithful, 